everyone and welcome to Designing Worlds, the weekly show about design and designers in virtual worlds, brought to you by Prem Perfect Publications. I'm Safia Widdishans and this week we're discussing some very important and significant changes in Second Life, which is for many of us the primary virtual world we inhabit. In the near future, Linden Lab, the company that created and runs Second Life, will be releasing two significant upgrades to the system, server-side baking and the ability for creators and users to use materials, both of which will significantly affect the way in which residents see their world. But what are those things? How do they work? How will they impact the performance of users? And because Second Life is an environment created by its users, how are they going to impact the experience of creators too? And also, why are these changes needed? To help us answer those questions, we're joined by four Linden Lab staff members who all belong to the teams working on these particular projects. So, I'd like to introduce Troy Linden, Senior Producer, who's working on high-level server-side baking, Nix Linden, Senior Software Engineer, who's working with the technical aspects of server-side, Brooke Linden, who's working on the high-level materials, and Oz Linden, Director of Open Development, who's working with the technical side of materials and with third-party viewers. Welcome to the show, all of you. Thank you. Thank you for Delighted having us. Delighted to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, I'd like to begin with looking at server-side baking, because I gather that big changes are imminent here. Let's start with the basics. What is baking, and how is it being handled now? I could, I could take that. So, uh, baking is a process where we take all of the information that, uh, that involves your avatar, how it looks, and we combine it uh, to deliver a finished avatar. Um, currently how it's handled right now, your computer, the individual's computer, is, is who handles all of the processing involved with determining your avatar's appearance, and it sends the results back to our servers. So it's a pretty involved process, and there's a bunch of, uh, a bunch of time uh, that it takes to do all that. Right. So what, how is that going to be changed in the future? How, in other words, what's going to happen in the future? And will it simplify it? Is that why we need it to happen? Absolutely. Um, Server-side baking is our new system. It's where we actually stand up the new service, or a new service rather, that we host that will handle all of the baking process on our end. And what this does is it actually takes the load away from your computer, the individual user's uh, computer. And the results are a faster, more consistent experience during the whole baking process in Second Life. Well, that sounds like a good idea. Um, so, just to be clear about this, what in the new system, what will be handed by the, handled by the server and what by the viewer exactly? So, the new viewer will be sending the server and recipient of the avatar data uh, while the server does all the calculations required. So, your viewer will download the results over a, uh, a lot faster HTTP connection. Oh, right, okay. So, um, that's the the basics of, of how it works, so to, so to speak. Um, how would you summarize the benefits to um, users? Well, simply put, it's a much faster and more reliable avatar resing experience. So you'll see, um, hopefully, less avatars being stuck in their clouded state, as well as uh, being stuck untextured. So they'll actually appear um, the way the users have intended it to be much quicker and more reliable. Right, so it, it will be an end to that problem where you, you kind of half res, <laughs> but your makeup is sort of blurred slightly, so you look as though you've been having a really heavy night. <laughs> <laughs> That's the plan, and we're, we're actually seeing great results so far, so we're very excited. That's fantastic. Are there, are there likely to be any downsides? The, there'll be less impact on people's machines? Is that what you're saying? Or or could there be more? Nix, you want to take that? Nick sure. He's actually uh, working on the tech end of things, so it'd be great for him to answer. Uh, so the one downside uh, 
of the new system is that because it is such a big change from how we have done things in the past, uh, everyone is going to need to update their viewer. Uh, it will be a mandatory update. Uh, users who don't update will uh, start to see even more avatars fail to load. Uh, fortunately, we have the viewer uh, that people need to download released, and users who uh, use any actively maintained third-party viewer uh, should be able to download an update presently as well. And as long as the users update, they won't see any downsides. Well, that's yeah. extremely mm. good news, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, so um, this is obviously really nearing completion then, or nearing implementation. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, about where the project is, what its current status is, and, uh, and what the timescales for introduction are going to be? Absolutely. Um, so we're in a multi-stage release. Uh, at this point, we have our first viewer release at the door. Um, so the next stage that we are going to be working on is standing up the service that is actually going to be doing all the work for resing your avatar. Uh, and over time, we will slowly roll out the new system uh, across the grid. Uh, that's going to take some time, and we're going to be following up uh, through our blogs and forums to let people know how that process is going. Uh, but we want to take our time with that process to make sure that everything is working as well as we think it is. That's great. So there's actually going to be a period when both mechanisms are in use. So, for example, one set of servers could be running the new system and another set running the old system. Absolutely. Right. So how long... Uh, do you think it'll be before the switchover is completed or or am I asking uh, how long is a piece of string question there? <laughs> uh, we're not sure uh, we're going to start the rollout process very slowly and we're going to be looking very carefully at our load numbers and make sure that the system we're standing up uh, will be able to handle everyone's uh, baking needs um, so we're going to be monitoring it as we are rolling it out to more and more uh, servers and then we will uh, scale it up as quickly or as slowly as we need to to make sure that there are no hiccups or problems. Okay, so um, so this is actually going to happen, uh, the actual rollout is going to begin very shortly um, and perhaps you can be a little bit more specific about that in just a second but, um, but, in the, but immediately um, if you have both systems operating, um, what's going to be the result? Say um, you move from a region running one system to a region running the other, or you look across from a region running one system to a region using the other. What uh, will will the uh, what will you actually experience if you do those things? That's actually a case we've been looking very closely at, and we've been doing a lot of testing around that. Uh, fortunately, the viewer we've released and the third-party viewers that have accepted our changes uh, should be able to handle that just fine. Uh, the viewer will be able to load avatars either using the old appearance system or the new appearance system. Um, the only thing that users might see is when they're transitioning from the old system to the new system, they might see their avatar reload, uh, but that's a process that will happen automatically and should be uh, very quick. Cool. Sounding rather good, actually. Yeah. Um, so, uh, presumably, you've got some fairly hefty um, testing and um, in-world scenarios that you're using to check that the whole thing scales correctly from um, smaller experiments to actually uh, use in a real live avatar environment. Um, now, right now, if you have, for example, 60 avatars in a region watching a concert, some of them uh, around them will be grey, others will have parts like hair or boots missing, whatever it is, especially if there's a lot of textures involved. Um, is that something that you're looking at? Absolutely. Um, we're definitely looking at that and we are also making sure that the service we're standing up will be able to uh, handle the load from avatars all across the grid, not just avatars localized in one region. Um, okay. And what we're finding is that the process of resolving an avatar uh, is 
not only quicker but more reliable so you should see less avatars in a clouded or gray state uh, even if you're all clustered in the same region. That sounds really good. Some people have however um, mentioned concerns that with the problems that we see from time to time with the asset servers putting more onto the server side could cause problems on the grid uh, and an example I was given it at the moment if your avatar isn't resing you can force a rebake uh, you can use the advanced menu and just rebake textures you can sometimes switch groups to kick a, a rebake and and there's one that I, I find completely weird but always works for me, yeah. which is that you switch the bald head you're wearing under your hair and you leap into, into <laughs> visibility. Now, will there be a way to force a rebake if the lab has a bad cache? Absolutely. We've, uh, in our viewer updates, we have uh, rewired the rebake avatar option in the menu uh, to work with either the new or old system, whichever you're using at the time. That's uh, so brilliant. Cool. Excellent. So we can still carry on rebaking. Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Um, now, if server-side baking affects avatars primarily, um, what's the effect going to be on things like mesh avatars, like um, animal avatars and uh, petites? And what will happen with mesh-based clothing? Uh, the system we're putting in place should not have a significant impact on any attachments that your avatar is using, including mesh-based attachments and mesh-based avatars. Uh, however, uh, the system should allow you to uh, load your base avatar uh, more quickly, which will allow the process of starting to load your attachments. Uh, that process will happen sooner. Right. Now, because clothing is becoming increasingly meshed-based rather than layer-based, do you think that SSB will continue to be useful as time goes by? I think it will because uh, as you appear in world, uh, the viewer will have to load your base level avatar even if you're not actively using it. And speeding up that process will mean that even mesh-based avatars will start the loading process uh, sooner. Ooh, okay, well, that's cool. Mm. Excellent. Now, um, now, here's a question which I'm sure many viewers want to know the answer, and you've touched on it a little already. Um, and so we know that you've been working very closely with the makers of third-party viewers, and we've already seen an update to Firestorm with server-side baking incorporated. What's going to be the impact on third-party viewers? Uh, presumably, they'll simply break if they're not updated, but um, how do you see this process um, going forward? And, and uh, is everybody uh, on board with this? Absolutely. We've been working with uh, all of our active uh, third-party developers for months now, uh, and they have had the code that they need to integrate and ship, and uh, I believe at this point nearly all of them already have updates uh, as we're taping this out for people to update their viewer. Um, and the avatar loading system will break for everyone, even people using our viewers if they don't update. So we are going to uh, start messaging pretty seriously uh, to let people know that they need to update their viewer. Right. Well, hopefully this program will be one way of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I understand that this should help mobile clients like Lumia and those users with limited mobile data plans. So what lies ahead? Are we going looking at some point in the future to fully cloud-based rendering uh, where all the heavy tasks of drawing a scene are handled remotely, uh, which could, I guess, pave the way for phone or tablet-based real-time clients? Unfortunately, we, we haven't announced any plans with regards to this, so okay. we're not in a position to answer right now, but um, yeah. Okay. That's been very illuminating. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean just the last question, I mean the whole discussion. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, we're, we're very excited about this. I mean, this is something that's, you know, we've been working on uh, here at the lab for a while. So mm. it's finally coming to head. We're seeing the results that we were expecting um, and then some. So we're, we're, we're happy. I think it's going to be very exciting indeed. Yeah, it really sounds like it, doesn't it? And uh, and I'm definitely looking forward to it. I've already upgrade, uh, upgraded my viewer, so I'm ready. Um, so what we should do now, I think, is to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll discuss the question of materials and the impact they'll have on Second Life. So don't go away. Radio Real is an internet public radio station with multiple streams on the air daily. We play an extensive variety of music for listeners with eclectic taste, from early music to Victoriana, big band and folk, plus drama and special programs. For more details, visit radioreal.org. The best things in life are free. wise man once said that no good deed ever goes unpunished. Mr. Quinn, I need your help. He wasn't kidding. I said I'd see Miss Alice home. Yeah, but I bet she didn't mention the risks. Did she? Monsters live out there. Welcome back to Designing Worlds, the show all about design and designers in virtual worlds. And this week, we're talking about two major developments in Second Life, the arrival of server-side baking and the adoption of materials. So, turning to the question of materials, Oz and Brooke, could you start by explaining what materials are and why it's going to be a good thing to have them? Sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, Essentially, it's a set of rendering improvements that allows you to, to more fully and richly describe the surface characteristics and how light should interact with surfaces. Um, you've got a fabulous example right here on your set. That bookcase in the back is, is, a, is a flat surface with book spines and shelves painted onto them. But no matter how you look at it or how you move light around, the shadows on the books don't change. There's no texture to them. Actually making little curves for each book spine and little edges for each shelf would be really expensive to model geometrically and would cause your, your object to be very expensive. But with materials, you'll be able to make each of those, those surfaces look like a curve by changing, uh, by applying a normal map, which in effect makes the light render as though the pixels were tipped just slightly. So one side of the book will reflect more sharply than the other. Similarly, specular maps will let you put uh, reflective highlights. So the, the lettering on the books could be more reflective and reflect in gold, say, than the, than the color of the book itself. So uh, with still a single flat piece of geometry, you can make something that looks very richly textured and, and uh, much, much more realistic and accurate. Mm, that sounds gorgeous. Yeah, doesn't it just? And I think we can see a demonstration. Um, perhaps you could explain uh, what we'll be seeing. Yeah, before I do that, I'd like to just 
point out one thing, and, uh, and that is that, that this system was originated uh, and prototyped by uh, third-party viewer developers. Specifically, the first prototypes were from the Exodus development team who have participated in, in the development, and we, they've since been joined by members of the Firestorm development team and the Catsnip viewer team. Um, so we're, this is really, and of course, a, a good deal of contribution from Linden Lab as well. Um, this has really been a, a stellar example of working together uh, to produce a new feature. Excellent. Um, cool. That's fantastic. And some of these uh, objects you'll see are produced by, uh, by residents as well. All right. So, so what are we going to, what are we actually going to see in this case? So we'll be taking you in world to view some of the items that we've been preparing for a, um, for a build. They include a building and some tunnels. In addition, we also will have some sample items uh, that we can show you, which show off a little bit more shine. Uh, so we'll be doing that. So the thing to notice about, about this is to look at the way the surface and the, and the edges of the windows are responding to the way the lights move, right? So you can see that the lights are casting shadows as, uh, and that those shadows move around and, and appear to be uh, affected by the bumpiness and the, and the indentation of the surface. But in fact, that's just a cube. It's a perfectly smooth, flat face that has no texture to it at all, except for the normal map that's been applied to it. That normal map causes each pixel to react to the light as though it was, it was uh, a, a bumpy surface. Um, and so you get lots of surface detail and, and lighting effects with no geometric cost at all. That's just a cube. So uh, this is Brooke Linden, and what we have here is a katana that was put together by June Dion of Bear Rose for us. We reached out to some content creators to help create examples and then write about their experience for our good building practices guide on the wiki. Um, as you can see, if you're looking closely, particularly the handle of the sword, as you see the lights go around the sword, you can see different uh, levels of shine and color of shine um, on the reflection of the sword. So once we are ready to launch materials, we'll be posting that description on the Good Building Practices Wiki and we'll link to this item which will be available for sale on the marketplace. That is just terrific. Yeah, she did a really great job. This is a really fantastic example. So if you, right now we're looking at the sword or the katana in uh, midnight environment settings, but one of the things that can create different effects is by looking at an item in sunset or sunrise because the different lighting will enhance different aspects and allow basically seeing the intensity of the effects at different levels. Uh, very, very bright light will, um, will not highlight them as much. When you have more shadows, then the uh, intensity is higher. So this, this area demonstrates a bunch of features combined of, of materials. So the wallpaper, 
if you zoom in on the wallpaper, you can see that it's got a subtle texture to it that's that's responding to the to the way the light moves, and the 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 sort of Fleur de Lis like patterns that are printed on the wallpaper are more sharply reflective than the red area around it. That's because they have a specular map that that makes them reflect differently. Uh, the the uh, the ceiling, looking up at the ceiling, is. Uh, uh, has this very nice, uh, you know, molded look to it, um, which is also responding to the lights as they move. Although they're not shining as directly there, it's not as it's not as as obvious. But both the wall and the ceiling are are completely flat. The floor in this room and the wainscoting also have nice texture to them. They look three dimensional. They respond to the light. There are these great grout lines between the tiles on the floor. All of those are perfectly flat surfaces. All of that apparent texture is created with normal maps and, uh, to some extent, specular maps to make them more shiny at the key places. In the middle of the room, we have this, this jacket that illustrates both normal maps and specular maps. And you can see that the features of the jacket, the seams, the lapels, the little decorative stitching, uh, all of that, and and in particular the folds of the jacket, it's got some little creases to it. And instead of those creases being painted in by by uh, static choices of where the light shines and where the shadows are, they're put in with normal maps so that they're responding to the way the lights are moving and and the shadows are in the right places. The shiny reflective cloth is shiny in the right pla in the places it would be in a real in a real shiny coat. So it's it's an example of what you can do and how realistic it is. All this was created by Gein Spad, one of the developers who's been who's been inspiring and contributing to the materials project from the very beginning. something about how you're planning to introduce materials and what time scale you envisage. Yes, we can. Um, so currently we have a project viewer available for anybody to try out and this is available on the alternate viewers page on the secondlife.com wiki. So please do check it out. Once the project viewer is stable, we will be using our typical viewer release process going through beta and then uh, production release. So we'll be keeping the blog up to date with those dates and look forward to getting feedback. We have a, um, a bug project which will allow users to provide feedback um, and this will, uh, will allow us to make it the best it can be. Excellent. Yeah. Very nice. Um, yeah, so... Uh, how could you summarize what this is going to mean for users in general and uh, in particular for designers and uh, and other creators so users are going to be able to get more detailed objects with less of an impact to the performance on their regions or parcels so more detail for less cost. They'll also be able to build out more photorealistic objects in their regions, as well as uh, apparel if they're using rigged mesh attachments. Um, designers will be able to, again, build more complex products, which will be able to respond dynamically to environment light sources and make shadows and shine more directionally accurate. Mm. Mm. Will there be an effect on, on land impact then? Using materials on an object, setting any of the materials properties on an object, 
will change that object to use the current accounting formula as opposed to the older legacy just count the prims formula so that it's more accurately reflects its its true cost mm. on server side and, and in the viewer. Um, so it's not simple to describe the effect. Uh, used well, this will enable you to get much better results at at lower cost than you than you could conceivably have done uh, before, mm. because the geometry expensive geometry it would take to duplicate the effect of of these things uh, would be uh, would be prohibitive. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, How is it going to be for uh, end users in terms of? the performance of their existing computers and graphics cards. Will uh, will people with older graphics cards, for example, have a bit of a problem with this, or is it actually going to make it easier even? Well, if you can, if you can turn on uh, the advanced lighting model, which in older viewers, we've renamed the option, in older viewers the option was called lighting and shadows. The new one is a little more vague, but it's also <laughs> a little less misleading. Uh, the Lighting and shadows actually had a good deal more to do with rendering than than just lighting and shadows. Um, so if you can turn that on, then your viewer is capable of of using this feature. We find that a lot of uh, you know from our stat statistics, we see that a lot of users who could turn that on, we can see what graphics cards they're using, don't have it on. And uh, I would encourage people to give it a try, especially when this feature comes out, because it'll uh, it, it really will be worth seeing. Mm. Cool. It certainly seems to. Are there limitations on where materials can be used? Materials properties can be set on any prim or any mesh, sculpties, the any any in-world surface, with just two exceptions, and those are um, you can't use materials properties on the terrain textures. Mm -hmm. And you can't use them on the avatar layers, the, the clothing layers that avatar baking does. Um, you can use them on prim-based clothing, attached clothing, mesh clothing, but mm -hmm. not on the, the painted-on layers that, uh, that the avatar bakes uh, combine. Right. But everything else is fair game. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, that sounds very good. Yeah, doesn't it actually? It's, it's more more I hear about these two new things, the more interesting it gets. Um, now, if uh, viewers will ex excuse me being a little bit more technical here, but I know this is something that uh, that some of our viewers would like to know: Are the plans to support anisotropic specular highlights in the future? And for the non-techies, what are anisotropic <laughs> specular highlights? Uh, okay, I confess, I had to look that one up. Uh, <laughs> but, so, uh, isotropic highlights is when light hits an object and reflects off of the object in all directions more or less uniformly. And isotropic hi highlights are highlights where light hits it and reflects differently depending on where on the surface it is. The, uh, the difference is really only visible in... in um, very shiny, um, finely textured, but not uniformly textured uh, objects. A great example is, uh, at least for those old enough to remember them, is light shining on a on a long playing record on a, on the grooves of a of an LP. Oh, right, yeah. you see oh. streaks of light coming off of the the surface of an LP instead of a generalized glow. Um, and the answer to your question is, alas, no, we are not going to support that. So. Um, uh, you can get marvelous effects otherwise, but that particular one isn't isn't on the list. Okay. Can I ask, are there other features not in the materials development viewer that you're planning to have active by the time materials go live? So currently all features are in the project viewer and we would love to have people check it out and give us feedback. Uh, before we make any decisions about future plans, we'd like to understand what the reception is of the materials uh, in this 
particular version of the viewer. We'll certainly continue to communicate any future plans on the blog. So we're excited to get this out and uh, can't wait to see what users do with it. Mm. <laughs> Things that you're not expecting, I should imagine that usually. <laughs> yes, that is that is typical, and yeah. I, I, I'm sure we'll get we'll get some amazing results. Absolutely. So, Brooke, if people want to find out more about materials, working with materials, is the documentation available? There isn't documentation available yet, but we are working on updating knowledge base articles and we're working with some creators to add articles to the Good Building Practices Wiki showing how they built an item which will then be available for, um, for users to purchase if they'd like. Um, the, we also have some more technical data that is currently available, which will explain to users how the, uh, the various channels um, will map when you're uploading the different texture types. And so that should help, but people should expect to find more information as we go through the release process. That's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to these, I must say. And uh, and this has been truly fascinating. And I do mm. like it when we have the opportunity to do a show that's a little touch more technical once in a while. That's right. I know you do, Alric. And I like it when we have a chance to invite people from the lab to explain some of the ways that they're developing the infrastructure to make this uh, an ever more fascinating virtual world. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it's great. Really very much appreciate uh, you guys coming along to talk to us and to our audience. And uh, we would like to thank Brooke, Nix, Oz and Troy Linden for joining us on the show here today. Yes, thank you. And thank you for giving us such a wealth of information on the new developments. It's terrific to be here. Thanks very much for inviting thanks us. Our, our yeah, product. thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for having us on. Now, don't forget that if you want to see this program again, you'll be able to catch it over the coming week on the Treat TV Lifestyle channel and on the Designing Worlds page at treat.tv or on the Designing Worlds blog. Next week, we'll be visiting a fascinating region of the mainland in Second Life, the 1930s-inspired Bay City, which is shortly to celebrate its fifth birthday. We'll be looking at how successful it's been in maintaining its character and how it plans to celebrate. It's a fascinating place and I'm really looking forward to visiting it. But for now, we must leave you and wish you fair winds and clear waters. Fair winds and clear waters. Thank <laughs> you.